Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Now, we're continuing our journey through the Bible. And today we pick up in Genesis chapter 37, verse 12. Now, when we were last together, we spoke of the two dreams that had been given to Joseph. And this is a prophecy of what will take place in the future. But in order to arrive at the point where his brothers and his father and his mother bowed down unto him, in other words, before we arrive at the point where Joseph is exalted, There is much suffering that he must endure. Now, again, remember, we're looking for similarities in this story and in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And so keeping that in the back of our minds as we read this story, let's begin together today in verse 12. Now, it says, Joseph's brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And so Israel, who used to be Jacob, His new name Israel said unto Joseph, his son, Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send you unto them. And so Joseph said to him, Here am I. I submit to your will. You are my father. And so Jesus said the same thing. He said he would submit to the father's will, even though it would cause him great pain and agony. And Jesus was aware of it, whereas Joseph is not. But even Jesus being aware of it, he said, not my will, but thine be done. And so Israel says to his son, Joseph, go, I pray thee, and see whether it will be well with thy brethren and well with their flocks and bring me back word again. So he sent him out of the vale of Hebron and he came to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, Joseph, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What are you looking for? What are you seeking? And Joseph said, I seek my brethren. Tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren, and he found them in Dothan. But when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. They devised a plot in how they would finally get rid of him because their jealousy had grown into their hatred and now their hatred grows into murder. And so they said to one another, behold, this dreamer cometh. Now notice it's all about this dream that he's had and they despise him. They hate him for it. And so they say in verse 20, come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will tell our father, some evil beast has devoured him. And we shall see what will become of his dreams then. So again, we see man trying to intervene in the plan and purpose of God, thinking that somehow they can thwart or change the plan of God. And this reveals their hearts. This reveals their relationship, that they don't truly know the true and living God. Now Reuben, he heard it, and he delivered Joseph out of their hands by saying, let us not kill him. Shed no blood, but cast him into the pit as you have planned, but do not lay a hand upon him. And he did this that he might rid Joseph out of their hands to deliver Joseph to his father again. So even though they devised to throw him into this pit and leave him there, Reuben was going to return later, free Joseph from the pit, and take him back to his father's, back to safety. Now we see here an act of betrayal by the ones that Joseph loved the most. And again, in the life of Jesus, we see the same betrayal through Judas, who sells Jesus into the hands of the Roman government, into the hands of the Jewish leaders, to be crucified and to be killed. Well, it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, the coat that his father had made him, the coat of many colors. And they despised that coat because it indicated the favor that Jacob, 
Israel had unto Joseph above all the other eleven brothers. And they took Joseph, and they cast him into a pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in the pit. And they, pretending that nothing had happened, with no pricking of the conscience, sat down to eat bread. And as they lifted up their eyes and looked, they saw afar off a company of Ishmaelites. Now, do do you remember who Ishmael was? He is the first son of Abraham that was cast out from the family of Abraham because as Isaac later came on the scene, the promised child from Jehovah God the Father, Isaac will be the one who inherits all the promises of God, all the favor of God, but even Ishmael, it was promised of him that he would be the father of many nations as well. And so we see this company of Ishmaelites, they're coming from Gilead on their camels, They're bearing spicery, balm, and myrrh, and they're carrying it down to Egypt. Now, Egypt, of course, is a pagan nation. And so Judah says unto his brethren, What profit is it to us if we slay our brothers and we conceal his blood? Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. Let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And so because there was money involved, There was profit to be made. The brothers were content by this. Well, in verse 28, it says, There passed by Midianites, merchantmen. They drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit, and they sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Now, remember, Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Are you beginning to see the many similarities between this story and the life and ministry of Jesus? Well, in having sold Joseph unto the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, the Ishmaelites brought Joseph into Egypt. Now, Reuben returns to the pit to get his brother, but Joseph is not in the pit. And so he tore his clothes. This is an act of mourning. And he is sorry that he allowed things to go so far. Well, Reuben returns to his brothers and he says, Joseph is not in the pit. And so what shall I do? Now, the reason Reuben says this is because he is the firstborn. He is the oldest of all the brothers. And so, obviously, his father, Jacob, Israel, is going to hold him accountable. Well, as one lie always leads to another lie, to another lie, to another lie, one deception always leads to more deception, they now take Joseph's coat, the coat of many colors, the coat that proved Jacob, Israel's favor unto Joseph above all the other brothers. They kill a goat and they dip the coat in the blood to deceive their father. And they bring the coat unto their father and they say in verse 33 that an evil beast has devoured Joseph. Joseph was killed and tore in pieces and there's nothing that we can do. And Jacob rent his clothes, put sackcloth upon his loins, and mourned for his son many days. And you would think this would eat away at the conscience of the 11 brothers and that they would come clean, but they do not because their hatred, their anger with their brother runs so deep that they don't even care how it affects their father as long as they can be rid of him. And all Jacob, Israel's sons and daughters rose up to comfort him, but he would not be comforted. He said, I will take this pain, this misery, and this suffering into my grave as I mourn for my son. And his father wept deeply for him. And the chapter ends by telling us that the Midianites, as they arrive in Egypt, they sell Joseph into the hands of Potiphar. But notice that Potiphar is an officer of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, He's an officer, a captain of the guard in his house. He's among the elite of Egypt. And so we see God's providential hand in the life of Joseph, caring for Joseph, and even in his early stages of such great suffering, we see God working behind the scenes to fulfill his ultimate plan. And so as we close this morning, friends, What we draw from this story is though whether we see it or not, because if you were to talk to Joseph at this point, all had come to an end. 
Things couldn't get any worse. And yet Joseph knew not what the future held. Nor do you and I, friends. We may look at our situation today and as bleak, as dreary, as hopeless as it may seem, trust in the providential hand of your God, friends, because you know not what the future holds. You do not know what God is preparing you for, how he's going to use you. And that's the message that is calling out to us from these pages that were written some 4,000 years ago. Trust in God and look not upon your circumstances. Lean not to your own understanding, but know that God your Father is faithful in working in you and through you to accomplish his perfect will. Well, friends, I trust as we are examining these Old Testament stories, these stories of the history of God's people and how he worked in and among them, that you are learning how to take the principles at, that lie within these stories and apply them to your life so that you will be a more faithful follower of the Lord Jesus as you walk your journey through this life and you develop your relationship with the Almighty. I trust that your journey will be blessed today, that your heart will be full of joy and your lips will be full of praise. Now, as he wills and until next time, friends, I truly love you. May the Lord Jesus bless you in all your desires to be the man and woman of God that he's called you to be. Now, as he wills and until next time, I'll see you on the next video.